All right, so um, yeah, we're going to talk about using video to deliver lectures um, because it's beneficial and you can use it to offset things or if we have to go completely online, this will be a good thing to have. Um, like I said, I'm going to actually not like I said, but we're going to not dive in right into the how to, but we're going to talk about some best practices for videos. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to do, um, I'm going to use poll everywhere in my slide deck. So if you haven't already, go ahead and open up a browser and go to the uh, link I put in the chat, which is pollev.com slash Jason Minos 281. And so we'll start with the first question. What do you think the optimal length for video is? And I should put uh, clarify that of for an online classroom video. And so you can see with Pull Everywhere, this is a plugin that you can uh, utilize for free for up to 40 responses that plugs into PowerPoint or Google Slides. Um, and so you can utilize this as a student response system. I usually is one I advocate for instructors uh, because it is free. There's no cost to students or instructors utilize it for higher education. Um, as long as your responses, you know, you have less than 40 responses for question. Um, and so we have an open response question here that we have coming in that everyone responding. Um, so we got for explaining concept, three minutes max, for lectures, five minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, about two to five minutes, 20 minutes or less, 15 to 20 minute chunks. All right, who wants to defend their answer? Go ahead and unmute. Anybody who's willing to defend their answer, why'd you say that? So I don't want to defend the answer. This is Roxana, but I don't think students watch anything that's longer than a minute, to be honest. <laughs> longer than a minute? <laughs> so gotta do I think that they need to be very quick, like snippets. It's almost like, uh, uh, you know, like, like key things or interesting or look at this sort of thing. So it's kind of like snakes on the plane kind of approach <laughs> this. very short, just in my experience. All right, so Roxana saying super short. Uh, Jillian, you're unmuted, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, so I, you know, of course with, with almost anything, it, a lot of the answers depends on who the audience is. And we know the younger the audience, the shorter the attention span. And I, I, I don't remember where I read this from, but I think my mind is hovering around anything over five to six minutes, we start to lose college students at some point. Um, but yeah, I don't remember where I got that from. Okay, so you're saying five to six minutes. I, well, I, I specifically wrote two to five. Okay, you wrote two to five. <laughs> I wrote two to five. Two to five. Okay, so you're saying maybe not as short as Roxanne is advocating, but still not 20 minutes as somebody as some of, of these other responses. Right, and I think in in the in the classroom um, when I was teaching K through 12, the the general um, idea is for every grade level you add the minutes behind it, uh, the, the the five minutes behind it. So it's what is it? The second grade, it's two chunks of five minutes. The, in other words, students will not sustain the energy or attention after 10 minutes. Same thing with the third grade and then fourth grade and so forth. So there's that, <laughs> there's that gotcha. answer too. Yeah, hey, we're, we're all like, there's, there's a lot of different ways we can interpret this and, uh, and think about this. So um, I will tell you where I'm pulling my knowledge from. Um, this comes from edX um, and their initial findings as they did MOOCs and Granted, MOOCs are not a great, you know, are not a one-to-one -one, um, transference of the population we're using, but it's still a pretty decent rule of thumb. And so you can see here, they have two different lines. Um, one, certificate earning students. So those who have skin in the game, those who paid money to get a certificate for engaging in the MOOC and those who didn't. And so what you can see here, six to nine minutes is where you get um, time spent in video. So about six minutes. And then anything after that, you start getting disengagement, uh, specifically um, people who don't have skin in the game. Um, but from what um, edX was finding, 
that the the optimal video length is about six to nine minutes. And I've seen that uh, spread across as other places uh, also. And I will share the links and actual research for these as we uh, at the end. So not necessarily a Roxanne is short, but Jillian was pretty darn close, about six to nine minutes. Um, so my can... answer was the three minutes and five minutes. There you go. Far. So, okay, sorry, Roxana. <laughs> That's so, all right. Um, about the length of a quibby for any guys who are, uh, you know, involved or subscribe to that. All right. Next question. Video shot in professional studios had more engagement. And this is, you know, as opposed to video shot with a webcam or something like that. Ooh. All right, a lot of you guys overwhelmingly believe false. Uh, I'm gonna call him Laura. Laura Tingleham. I just butchered that last name. What'd you pick? You certainly did. It's Tillman. Obviously. Tillman. Okay. Uh, just based on what I've seen, um, if you think about like how popular a lot of YouTube channels are that are you know produced in people's basements and things like that, it matters more like how you're engaging with people versus the audio production quality and the video production quality based on what I've heard from people. Okay, so you're I think going there's with like a minimum. There's like a minimum. Like if you can't hear someone or their face is completely in shadow, that's different, but. Uh, we don't cover it in this one, but one of the things I always covered when I was teaching this area to free service teachers is that audio quality is definitely is uh, more important than video quality is what people have seen. Because at least with um, audio, you can at least hear if, uh, if, the, if the video is poor. Uh, whereas the, if the audio quality is bad, you're not going to get nearly as much. Um, all right. Who's one of my true? Anyone willing to talk about why they chose true? Um, I chose true. This is Kristen. Um, I didn't give it a whole lot of thought, but I thought that maybe uh, students, a lot of them identify as visual learners, which I know the learning styles um, that are, you know, video, audio, whatever, aren't really real. Those are kind of a myth, but I think a lot of students uh, still are, you, you know, so often engaged in, in visual um, media that maybe production value, particularly video, would be important to them. So you're yeah. saying, so you're saying because they manipulate with or interact with digital with the digital medium so often that they're going to want higher quality of it. That was my guess. Yep. Okay. Um, the actual response, at least from edX and what they've seen with their engagement, is high production value might not might not matter. Um, so you can see on our two graphs here, instructor sitting at a desk recorded with a webcam versus instructor in a professional, um, not necessarily a professional recording studio, but a room, a classroom that was uh, built with professional um, cameras and everything. You got more engagement on instructor sitting at a desk as opposed to instructor sitting on a podium. So, you know, I won't say it won't matter at all, but, you know, you're going to get slightly better engagement if it's a little more personal. You know, you can stare right at the webcam and see them. How does one measure engagement? Uh, this was measured by uh, the amount of time watched. Um, and so they didn't, I've, I don't think they had questions interspersed in the videos, but it was more on, um, they, they have heat spots where they can watch, uh, see how much they watch the videos. All right, next one. Oh no. Oh wait, I don't have any question for this one. Pre-production matters. And this is more talking about um, video length and whether it's a pre-planned out 
I'm going to chunk this information and make sure it's specifically chunked in three to five minutes information. And so you might have 15 minutes worth of video, but you've pre-planned it out to where I'm going to stop at this five minute point, this six minute point, and this um, four minute point. Uh, whereas if you had pre-recorded something for 15 minutes and then um, went in and ch um, uh, chopped it up later. And so what they what this was compared against is some instructors couldn't pre-record or couldn't plan out their uh, their recordings. And so they took their old lecture captures that they had before and then chunk it up into um, you know, smaller increments. And you know, the instructors who took the time to plan it out got more engagement than instructors who took, you know, who just took old lectures and then chop and then chopped them up. So, you know, as you're moving forward and thinking about recording any kind of lectures, you know, take time to plan. What is, you know, where is a good five minute, you know, three to five minute point to stop in this? And so that way you can increase the engagement across the board. Which is definitely crit criticable. What do you mean? What do you mean by that, Nick? Sorry, the question was uh, Angela's question above. How does okay. one measure engagement? And I, my assumption was it's based on eye contact that they're tracking, tracking viewer, viewer how, how much they're watching the videos. Yeah, I don't think it's based on eye contact. I think it's it, it's more based on just interaction with the video player. Okay. Um, make them thinking you enjoy doing this. Um, basically, you know, show some enthusiasm. I know it's really hard to do that when you're just sitting at a desk by yourself um, and just talking like, you, you know, talking to no one in particular. But, you know, the data that's come back is they looked at speaking rate and those who spoke faster, you know, basically those who had some sort of enthusiasm in their voice had better engagement with the videos that they made. So even if you're sitting at your desk recording it by yourself, you know, pretend like you have someone that you're actually talking to or put a picture of somebody behind your webcam so you can talk to them and, you know, lecture them on what, you know, what you're talking about. All right, next question. Students engage with tutorial videos different, uh, students engage with tutorial videos different than lecture videos. So tutorial videos showing you how to do something, lecture videos disseminating information. Hundred percent true. Oh nope, there we got a false. So the question is, they engage with tutorial videos how to do something completely as the same way as they would engage with a lecture video. All right, looks like we got overwhelmingly true. This is true. Students engage differently with tutorials versus lectures. And so we can see over here uh, on our two graphs here, tutorials were rewatched, whereas lectures were not rewatched. And so, you know, think about when you're making these videos, think about what you're actually doing. Are you watching, you know, are you making a lecture? Are you doing a tutorial? And so if you're doing a tutorial, you know, one of the things you want to try to do is try to, you know, uh, drop in key um, markers or explanation points saying, okay, in step one, step two, step three. So that way, you know, students can look at transcripts or looking at the closed captions and jump right to that area that you're talking about. Um, whereas lectures, um, they're not really rewatching. And so you want to make sure you're trying to engage with the first watch, uh, first watch crowd, basically make it as interesting as possible because you know, they're not going to go back and watch it again and make sure it's the right time length. So a summary, sort of videos are more engaging, uh, videos produced with more personal field could be high, more engaging than high fidelity, high fidelity studio recordings. Um, do the pre-work, make sure you work out to plan out what you're talking about. Um, show your enthusiasm, enthusiasm, and then understand that you're making 
two different types of videos, lectures or tutorials. And those go with the recommendations on what to do. I will share the slide deck with Robin and Martha to throw up on the ACE workshop so you guys can view it later. Um, and then for any other questions on, on thing, this is my sources because we always have to cite our sources. So any questions before we move forward with how we make videos? Actually, I have a qu quick question. Yeah. Uh, not in a creepy surveillance type of way, but is there any, <laughs> any way that once we put, say, a video online in Moodle or whatever format we're sharing, we can kind of know, like, not just how many people clicked on it, but how many people have finished it or something like that? Um, I'd just be curious because I know I've had some short videos and some longer videos, and I'd be curious to know what, how if they work we, for students, besides just asking students, which is probably the most direct way. If you um, utilize Kaltura, then yes, we you can look at the analytics on the back end. Um, I believe instructors can. Um, I always get confused because I have admin privileges, but I'm 90% sure instructors can look on the back end to see the analytics of individual videos. Gotcha. So, and I will confirm that and share it in the future if I can't confirm it today. All right. So let's talk about how to make a video using the tools that we have here at PSU. So I'm gonna end my slideshow. Um, so if I go to my courses under Plymouth.edu, over on the right hand side, you have two different tools that you can uh, utilize. One is Zoom. Um, right now, if you log into Zoom, um, and then record your Zoom meeting to the cloud, it does um, automatically transfer over to your Kaltura video library. And so if you record to Zoom and record to the cloud, all the back end, it takes that video recording and drops it into your Kaltura video library. Um, Kaltura is to use, you know, basically for recording with yourself or doing a screen capture. And so what you can do is if I come here and click Kaltura, right here, it brings up my media. So these are all the things I've recorded. If I wanna do a new recording, I click add new, and then I will do a Kaltura capture. It asks me if I have already have it installed, as if it asks if I wanna open it. Otherwise you need to download it for Windows or Mac, install it, and then redo that step, and then you'll uh, ask you to open it. So you can see here, we have a couple different things. Um, we can record with a camera. So I can choose what camera I wanna record with. I can't record with the one I'm using, so I go with my integrated one. And you, know, you can see me on the camera. If I don't want to record my camera, I can turn that off. Um, I can record my screen. And so I have two different screens here, so I can choose what I want to record. So I want to record my generic monitor. And so I can see what I want to record here. Um, by default, it does the full screen. If I just want to do a selected area, I could do that by clicking that and say, I only want to do you know, this area or I can chain, change it by clicking and dragging in the corners. Generally, I do the full screen. It just makes it easier. And then you have your audio. What do you want your audio source? Always check your audio source. Um, you know, quite often, you know, at least for myself, I have my headset, I have the microphone built into the laptop, and then I have the USB camera. Um, I usually recommend, if you can, get a headset, something like this, um, that way you're get better audio quality. Um, but if you do that, make sure you're under, you know, you're using the right, uh, right audio. I've had it too many times where I thought I was on my headset and I was recording on my laptop microphone, which is, isn't that great. And me being the way I am, I had to go back and re-record it. Um, so once that happens, I just click record. I get a countdown. 
and then it starts recording. I can see the recording and the, you know, the recording option that's at the bottom right. It's recording my screen. As I talk, it's recording. And then I click stop and I can say, yes, I want to stop recording. So you can see it's got two videos for it. I can change my title so I can say lecture one, recording. And then I can save it and save it locally because if I don't have a great internet connection, I can uh, save it and then go to a place with a better connection and upload it later. Or I can click save and upload, which I will do right now. And then it gets the pending and I can see it gets uploaded. And so after a little while, it will um, appear on my, my media library. Yes, Roxana, when I say locally, it saves on the local machine. So if I just click save, it doesn't upload to my Kaltura media library yet. If I click save and upload, then it will upload to my Kaltura library. So this is uploaded. Now your Kaltura library, it has unlimited storage. So you don't have to worry about um, having a, you know, running out of space. And so if I go back to my Plymouth and go to my media, nope, I don't want to open Kaltura, but I want to see my media. You can see my lecture one that I just recorded, it has uploaded. And then if I click into it, it's probably going to show a video process. Nope, it's actually done. Um, longer videos will take time to process. Um, so meaning it has to put it into different, you know, transcode it to different ways to make it easier to stream on different areas. Um, so from here, I have my videos in my media library. If I want to put this in my actual class, I would come to my Moodle course, turn my editing on. I would add an activity or resource. And then I would scroll down to Kaltura video resource. Once I click add, I can give it a name. And then if I click on this add media button, it's going to go to my media library or my Kaltura media library. And so I have all the videos I saw you saw earlier. These are ones I can do. So I click select because I want to do this one. does the video and I click save and return the course. And now I have my lecture in there. Um, and so if I click on lecture one or if a student click, uh, clicks into that, they can play it right from here. And so I don't have to worry about, um, sorry, the nice thing about uploading it this way or going through Kaltura is that it's uh, built for streaming. Um, a lot of times what I've seen instructors do is when they click add activity or resource, they'll upload a file and upload an actual media file, which isn't great because one that puts the media file on our servers at PSU, which takes up space on our server, and then is not built for streaming. Whereas with your Kaltura video library, it is built for streaming. Jessica asked a question about uploading videos, so not recording straight, but uploading through Premiere Pro. Um, if I go back to Kaltura here, if I want to upload a video, when I click add new, I can just do media upload here. And then I can just drop the video file in there to upload it. Um, so backtracking, yes, it does do closed captioning. It automatically uh, captions videos. Um, it does need to be looked at. It's not always 100%, but it does have uh, captioning. And then are we going to keep Kaltura when we switch to Canvas? Yes, um, it does work within Canvas. UNH is using Kaltura with Canvas. Okay, so making sure I'm getting all those questions. Yep. Um, 
so that's how you can get the video into one of your lecture uh, into one of your Moodle shells. Um, one of the other features that you can do, and this is where you have to go uh, to your uh, My Media outside or your My Media Media space. I will put the link for this in the chat. If you go here and then signed in, this is where your media library is at. And let's say you made a video that you wanna share with somebody outside of Moodle. Uh, forever, whatever reason you need to, you know, you wanna be able to share it to them over video or something like that. If you click on your video title, you can then publish, make it unlisted, click save, and then if I click share, I get a link to a media page, meaning anybody could watch. So if I would put that link into our chat, anybody can go watch that lovely video of me uh, without having to be within Moodle. So if you're trying to collaborate with colleagues for something else or want to show a student a quick uh, how to on something, but don't need to put it in Moodle, that's how you can share a video with somebody outside of Moodle that you create. So I'm going to stop there for a second. Does anybody have any questions that I haven't touched upon? If a student wanted to, could they download to watch later or does it only stream if it's posted to Moodle? Um, in Moodle, they can download to watch later. So if you can see right here, if I click on the video, over in the top right, there's a button right here for okay. downloading. Any other questions? Can I just say a little plug? Go. So I used to use another um, software screen, or it's not software, it's through a website, Screencast-O-Matic. Yep. And you would either pick like your view or a small part of the screen or, but what I like about um, Kaltura after using it for the first time this summer is that the student can choose what, how they view. So it will record you and your screen if you allow it to. And the student can say, I wanna see my professor said super big and the screen really little, or I want to see them side by side. So the student has a lot more choice in how those two types of images are, sh are viewable for them, which I don't think is always available in other formats. So that's a, something I've enjoyed about Kaltura. Yeah, you can see right here, I have my screen that it recorded and me on the camera. If I were to click this toggle view button up here, it switches it. And so it puts my screen small and my camera big. Otherwise, I can change and I want to do a side by side, I can do something like that. So those are there are options for that when it comes to um, um, Kaltura. Um, can you make it so students cannot download the video from Moodle? Um, unfortunately, we can't do that on a case by case basis. It's, it's kind of either on all or nothing because we have to program that program that in on the back end. And we figured uh, we went with the download option because of the um, unreliable internet options that some students have uh, in order to be able to facilitate offline viewing. Any other questions? Hi, Jason, it's Eric. Are there yes. um, format issues if I'm out using a GoPro to record some lecture outside or some different software, do I have to worry about all the different video formats before uploading? No, um, unless you're, unless what you're recording records in a non-standard format, but I mean, I would imagine most things nowadays are to be recording in MP4, um, but it handles, Kaltura handles most of your standard video formats. Um, and then it, when it uploads it, it converts it to what it transcodes it to what's it need, what it needs in order to do um, uh, functional streaming. So you should be fine, especially using any major recording item. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, earlier, someone brought up uh, brought up analytics. If you go to media space. So not within my media, but in the media space link that we talked about earlier, um, you can look at the analytics of the video by clicking on the video and then clicking uh, actions. 
And so this is where you can see the analytics of engagement and, you know, how many plays, unique viewers, minority views, and your average completion rate. So if those of you guys who want to creepy stock your students, this is the way, you know, by going to the media space, and I will put the link in it in the chat again, bookmark this, and then you just click on the video, and then go to the analytics under actions to see how many times something's been viewed. Um, all right, so that's how you can make a standard video. The other option that you might have seen Um, I can do a video quiz. And so that's where I can take a video that I have in Kaltura and intersperse quiz questions in it. And so I'm going to select this video that I've recorded that we recorded earlier. And so you can see here, I have my uh, video and then as I play it, or as I use my marker, and then I'm going to forget how to do this. Where do I hit the button to add a question? I want the quiz. There it is, right there where I don't expect it. So if I want to add a question at this point in the marker, I can click add a question and I can do multiple choice, true, false, reflection point or open ended question. So if I want to do a multiple choice question, I click on multiple choice here and I can say, uh, you know, who's on first and type my responses. Mark which one, uh, go with, you know, that one is my correct one. And then I can shuffle my responses. And then if I want to give a hint, I can give a hint or a response why. So if I click save, you can see it marks a question here. If I want to move my marker, I can then add another question. Reflection point is just a point where they can pause it or where the video pauses. I can say, think about life, the universe, and everything. And then click save. And so now I have a reflection point there. Once I'm done, I can click done here. And now my video quiz is done. And so if I want to deploy this in my class, same thing as before. I go to my class, I click on add activity or resource. And in this case, I'm going to add an external tool. I'm going to do a pre configured tool and I'll do Kaltura video quiz. Give it a name. And if I click select content, all the quizzes that I've made come up and I can select this one. And I click save and return the course. And now I have a video quiz. And so if a student jumps into here, it takes a minute to load. So they get told, hey, you're beginning a quiz. All questions must be answered. The quiz will be submitted at the end. And so you can see where the marker's here. It comes up. And I can say, I don't care, and select that one. And then it gives my reflection. And then I can continue. So that's one of the ways, if you're going to have a longer video, one of the ways to help break that up 
or utilize it is to make it into a quiz. So you get kind of that break and reflection point for students to actually interact with the video to take their engagement from passive viewing to active viewing with it. Any questions? Uh, Jillian, I do not know if they're accessible on a download. I don't think so, specifically because there's no download option for a quiz up here. Any other questions? Yes, the quiz results do get added to the gradebook. Um, they get added automatically. If you don't want them to have any weight, then you can always go into the gradebook setup and change that. So if I go to my gradebook setup here, you can see my external tool, lecture one recording. I can just put that as zero weight. So you can make it as practice as opposed to um, um, an actual grade. Any other questions? All right. Well, that is all I have for you guys. As you know, I am here for help. If you run into problems as you're trying to uh, record Kaltura or set up a quiz or get something into your class. Um, totally, you know, put it, throw in a ticket to the help desk. It'll get routed to me and I can do that. Uh, Wendy asked a generic question, do Zoom recordings automatically save to the cl uh, cloud? Not by default. Uh, well, when you click record in Zoom, you get two options. You can record to local or record to the cloud. If you record to the cloud, it does uh, record to the cloud and then gets put into your Kaltura uh, media library. If you record local, it doesn't rec it doesn't save the cloud and you would have to upload it manually to your media library. How do we edit text for closed captions? That was a good question. Um, and give me a second to get there. Okay, um, so if I'm in my media space and I will reshare my screen before I forget. So if I'm in my media space and I click actions and edit, I have my captions here and I can click on edit captions. And so you can see here where the captions are. If I'm like, oh, I didn't say no problem. I said big problem. I can go in and edit that text uh, just by typing on it and changing it. And then once I click save, um, it saves it and puts that back in. Do we have to set up our Kaltura library? Nope. Um, once you log in with Kaltura, your library automatically gets created and then any video you uh, uh, create gets stored there. Jason, I have a more general question. Yep. If I can see the usefulness of the tools for the online asynchronous course, what would you say is a good way to use videos in a live face-to-face -face class? Um, for live face-to-face, -face, I would say um, employing like a flipped class model where um, you only have limited time and you want to, instead of doing the lecture in class, you give them the lecture before class and then they come in and do the application. 
Um, so if you're doing like a chemistry lab or something like that, you can front load the knowledge before they come in and then have them apply it to the lab um, during class time. Or if you're doing a group discussion or in a Socratic seminar, a seminar and you want them to have a baseline of knowledge uh, when they come into class, you can have the, you know, have the lecture video that they need to watch before they come to class. And that way you can have that class time devoted to uh, the seminar. Okay, thanks. Yes. And I'm not the only expert here. If anybody has any other ideas for, you know, utilizing video, please chime in. I, I know people who successfully used it too for um, assessment. So sometimes people find it's a lot more natural and easier to do, to re respond or reflect on student work through video or even audio than writing comments or typing comments. Um, I definitely know some faculty say it's faster to do it that way. Obviously, you would not post those publicly in the course because those would be for like a group of students or an individual student, but you certainly could use these same tools that Jason is showing us to create videos that you then shared with individual students as part of an assessment. Thank you. Yeah, my wife does that when she um, does English paper sometimes. Is she'll record herself going over the paper and making comments um, and then share that video with the uh, individual student. And she's gotten some pretty positive feedback um, on when she's done the reflection that way, as opposed to when she just does uh, text-based re uh, text um, responses for it. Mm, it's more personal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, they can, there's, how you say something can just be, it uh, can be as important as what you say and getting that positive tone in there can make a, all the difference. Can I ask a quick question? No, Laura, you've already used your lot of questions. <laughs> uh, so I was really curious about students being able to record video instead of writing as a way to like participate in say a discussion forum, which I don't know, maybe the, anyway. No, that's a so great like in question. Moodle, um, I know if you use the Moodle discussion forums, there's like a link where, where students can attach, I think. <laughs> It, a culture it, of video, but I'm just curious, like, has anyone ever used that? That seems really clunky, um, but so I don't to, know. To go over what she's talking about, if I go to my class here, and actually I'll talk about two different things. So I've demonstrated this before. So if I can go into my discussion as a student, whoops, not that, wrong button. If I click reply, right here in this, in our messages box, there's the Kaltura video media option. So if you or your students were to click that, it goes to their, you know, that person's media library. They can select what video they want to do. And unfortunately, this is kind of wonky right now, but you would click the embed media right there. And so then you would click post a forum. And so that video that they recorded then appears in the forum instead of you know, doing a text. Um, so that's one place you can do video for discussions. The other thing is if you have your students do a video project and want them to submit a video, instead of doing an assignment, um, what you can do is add activity a resource and do Kaltura media assignment. So if I click add there and I can say um, demo teaching video and I tell them please submit a video recorded lesson this gives them a place where they can submit something through a media submission from their um, Kaltura video library. So if you want them to submit a video for an assignment, um, the Kaltura media assignment would be the way to go and not your just regular Moodle assignment. So a quick follow-up, they will have to record a Kaltura video ahead of time and then embed that say in a discussion forum or in the Dropbox for that Kaltura media assignment. They can't just like record it 
lot. You know what I'm saying? Like they have to kind of like do that they, first and then embed that or link it. If they click add media submission, they come to their Kaltura video media library and they, if they already have it, they can select it or they can do add new and then media upload. Um, if they already have the recorded the video from something else. Oh, okay. So if they want to like use their phone or something. Yes. And then get that. They have, they have okay. to figure out a way to get their phone, get the video <laughs> off their phone into their yeah. computer. Um, and then they can upload it that way. Okay. Otherwise they have to record the capture beforehand and then uh, select the video. Thanks. Yep. Anything else? All right, let's call it then, Martha. I think we're done. I'm going to stop the recording.